I am Shannon Weber with Hive, a hub of positive reproductive and sexual health. And we're here in San Francisco, California. It's October, maybe the 26th mm -hmm. or yep. something around the 26th. It's not quite yes. Halloween. Yep. <laughs> uh, 2015. And I'm here to talk with. I'm Erin Wilson. I'm a research scientist at the San Francisco Department of Public Health in the Center for Public Health Research. Great. And we are making this video because there's an informal working group here in San Francisco of folks interested in how we can make trans, queer, women-friendly prep materials and realize that there are a few sources of data here in San Francisco about what trans women might want or believe or know about prep. And so we want to gather this together and be able to share it with other people. But first of all, I want to ask you if you can just ground us in this background of how many trans women are in San Francisco, you know, anything we know about the numbers and what's the rate of, uh, what you know, how many people are HIV positive and known or HIV negative status that we know. Okay, so in San Francisco, we collect data. We did a couple behavioral surveillance studies in 2010 and 2013 to try to get a sense of both the population size and how many women are living with mm -hmm. HIV at the moment. So at the moment, the estimate of how many trans women are living in San Francisco at any point in time is around 1,500 trans mm -hmm. women, and it waxes and wanes, and we don't know much about in and out migration into the city. And among those 100 or 1,500 trans women, we estimate around 40% of them are living with HIV. Mm -hmm. So an extraordinary prevalence higher than any other population in the city. Mm -hmm. And then tell me, just ground me on where the data is going to come or is coming from that yes. we're going to talk about today. How did you learn about what, what trans women think or believe or want out of PrEP? Okay, so there is this kind of data-free zone about um, PrEP interest among trans women and who would be eligible. So what we did was we took those surveys in 2010 and 2013, the most recent one in the end of 2013, and looked at a study of over 200 trans women in San Francisco. And we asked questions around sexual behavior that allowed us to investigate how many trans women would be eligible for PrEP based on CDC criteria around sexual behavior and injection drug use behavior. So the first question was just how many trans women would be eligible based on those criteria and do those criteria fit the epidemiology of HIV among trans women. Mm -hmm. So that's one source of data. And then we also have a longitudinal study. So that was from the TEACH study, the transgender um, education and community health outreach study that was, again, 2010 and 2013. And then we also have a longitudinal study called the SHINE study. It's not an acronym, miraculously, but it's a longitudinal study following 300 young trans women ages 16 to 24. And so we took those data to do the same thing as we did with adults and see how many would be eligible for PrEP based mm -hmm. on CDC guidelines. And then we also asked some of our youth to participate in a PrEP survey. And we asked questions about, do they know about PrEP? Would they be interested in it? Have mm -hmm. they ever heard of it? Do they know anybody on it? Questions like that. So there were 69 youth that participated in that survey. And then the third source of data were focus groups we did specifically about PrEP. And one mm -hmm. was with monolingual Spanish-speaking trans women in San Francisco. The other was with a mixed group of adult trans women who spoke English and a group of our Shine youth, so and a few other youth from the community um, up to age 24 about PrEP and their thoughts about it and would they take it and what's their perceptions of their risk for HIV and why they would or wouldn't take it. And we're going to link to your slides in the blog post of people who are really into the numbers and kind of de data geeks can go through that or they can also yes. reach out to you with questions. But then to give us a time frame, so that first set of data I think was from 2013 and then the second two are from 2015. Right, so the, the adult data from our behavioral surveillance TEACH study is, uh, was that the data were collected in 2013, the end of 2013. Mm -hmm. And then our SHINE study, we used data from our baseline um, survey which was ended in 2014, and then we specifically did a prep survey with our, our Shine youth in 2015. Great. And the survey, the focus group data were from 2015 as well. So Great. that's recent so helpful. Get, yeah. So what are women's, trans women's concerns or barriers or perceived barriers around prep? So this is where I want to just ask you about that individual level yes. information that you got. So some of that individual level was, a, you know, people were not concerned about affordability, interestingly. they. I think they probably access care in various places, and so they're not concerned about that. What they're concerned about are things that everybody else is worried about, about taking a daily HIV medication, whether they could actually implement that in their lives. Um, they were really worried about HIV stigma and about partners seeing the, them with an HIV pill. 
um, or something that's recognized as an HIV treatment pill. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of another really important issue was among youth, there was just a misperception about what put themselves at risk for HIV. Mm -hmm. So a pervasive lack of knowledge around basic health ed um, that would inform HIV prevention behaviors. Mm -hmm. So they thought, you know, if they topped somebody, they were not going to be at risk. Um, it was mm -hmm. only concerned for if they were at the bottom. And there were certain partners that were probably risky and others that weren't. Mm -hmm. So among youth, it was a, a major education issue. Among adults, it was the concerns that everybody else has around HIV and taking PrEP in their daily lives. And then tell me about the numbers of people, women who knew about PrEP to begin with. So that was interesting. Mm -hmm. So the beginning, so in our TEACH study, virtually no one had heard of PrEP, um, and that was the end of 2013. So among adult trans women, there was very little knowledge, and there was nobody actually taking PrEP. Um, and that was at the end of 2013. Among youth, we see kind of an uptick that around, you know, I think 40% of them mm -hmm. or so were, were in, potentially interested in taking PrEP and knowledgeable about it. So we don't know if that was younger people are just more in the know, have seen the media, and therefore they know more, or um, it was just there was, you know, time between 2013 and 2015 that there was more knowledge transference and youth were, were learning more. But mm -hmm. Generally speaking, very low compared to other populations where they've been surveyed about their PrEP knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then more trans women living with HIV knew about PrEP than trans women not living with HIV. So somehow the message is getting out there in some fashion, but not necessarily to the audience that we right. can, would hope. Yeah, and in our Shine data with youth, that you know, similarly, there may be something that has to do with their interface with the medical system. So mm -hmm. youth who had been tested and knew their status definitively as negative were more likely to have heard of PrEP and be interested in be candidates versus those who didn't know their status. Interesting. So it's perhaps those folks who are unknown are not getting tested because they're not at risk. That might be one scenario. But um, it seems like there's a big opportunity for anybody, either at the testing site or at a care site, even if it's not HIV care, if it's their hormone therapy or their trans-specific health care. Those mm -hmm. are opportunities to talk about PrEP. Mm -hmm. And what did you learn about this messaging or marketing? So the marketing is, you know, the biggest lesson we learned is that there's no one message that's going to reach the adult trans women or youth, um, trans youth audience. Mm -hmm. So there were, you know, specific messages that, you know, Clearly with youth, there needs to be some basic HIV education. I think with adults, there was a lot of conflation between PEP and PrEP was one issue that also came up. Yep. So how do we differentiate those messages with these acronyms that are so very close and, and, and tell folks that sent ones for prevention um, over the year or risk period and ones immediately after an exposure. It's a really technical and hard differentiation. Um, Folks did not want to see anything in, you know, in the Castro. They they don't spend time there, and though they know that the marketing around prep has been targeted toward gay men, and there's been a lot of marketing in the Castro, mm -hmm. they don't spend time there. They don't feel at home in that community, and so if messages were targeted to that um, neighborhood, it wouldn't reach them. Anyways, yeah. yeah. So it needs to kind of go out of the mm -hmm. neighborhoods we typically see as LGBT. Mm -hmm. And so that this is one of my favorite slides that you have, and it's called Place Matters. So in addition to the fact that the Castro is not the place that trans women are going or getting information, what else did you learn about place? So what else did we learn about place? We learned, um, you know, that the, the clinic, there were trusted clinics where people said that they would be interested in taking PrEP. So we're very fortunate in San Francisco to have trans-specific health clinics, and people really do trust those places. Like, for instance, our monolingual Spanish-speaking adult trans women all went to Tom Waddell Clinic. Pretty much mm -hmm. everybody in the room went to Tom Waddell Clinic, and one of the reasons they went there is because they have Spanish-speaking staff. So for women who don't speak English, that's the place to go. And they have these kind of like friendship networks that the information around PrEP or anything health-related or identity-related really was transferred between peers. And so mm -hmm. um, having PrEP offered in those very trusted spaces, I think, is the only way to go to you know have that information both disseminated and have people actually be willing to take something from a provider that they trust is the only way to go. Mm -hmm. And so even in San Francisco where you have so many resources and so much LGBT awareness and all these things, it was interesting that the T is actually not um, consistent across all of the clinics and places. And so we still need to do work in that area, but then also support the areas where trans women feel comfortable and where they trust their provider. Yeah, and I think each, I mean, even within our trans health clinics, each trans health clinic in the city serves a different group and people feel more comfortable at those places. Mm -hmm. So again, it's the marketing is going to have to be segmented as well as where people offer it. Anywhere where there's trans health care being provided, 
folks should consider offering prep. Yep. And then tell me this, your recommendation around that. So yes. all of this now that you've learned and been talking with so many trans women, what do you suggest around the CD, implementation of the CDC recommendation? So the CDC recommendations, one interesting data point we found among you know over 200 adult trans women, um, and then we took out those who were positive in our sample to assess who would be PrEP candidates based on CDC criteria, and only about 30% of those negatives would have been eligible. And from my perspective, I, we don't know enough about the sexual networks of trans women or where they're getting HIV not to offer it to everybody, that mm -hmm. trans women don't have risk behaviors um, related to HIV over and above any other population at risk or any other population in general. However, their prevalence is so much higher. You know, this 40% prevalence in San Francisco is shocking. So it's not happening within the trans women community, and it's they are getting HIV from other people outside of their specific community. And so to only offer PrEP to 30% of the community would miss a lot of people mm -hmm. and will not curb the epidemic among trans women if we don't offer it to, to everybody, quite frankly. I think among trans women, the epidemiology suggests that that everybody should be offered because it's really their, who their risk networks are, not their individual behavior. So to the extent that they can have something as a choice for prevention, it right. could really make a difference in their lives. Right, and, and you, I learned from you that uh, since we don't know where they're acquiring or being exposed to HIV, and as such, nothing's being provided to those partners for HIV prevention, that it really is on us as individuals and a community to really show up for trans women and offer them choices that will work for them that give them some control. Yes, that's a huge, it's a huge gap in our epidemiology of understanding the epidemic among trans women, but it's also, like you said, missing partners. So I think St. James Infirmary has one group where they're working with partners of trans women, and that's kind of the only game in town that I know of that's actually serving partners. Mm -hmm. And I think that sounds like it's the same with um, cisgender women, yep. that partners are really left out of the dialogue. Yep. And so how can we serve everybody, their loved ones and, and trans women themselves that, yeah. that are offering and marketing prep. Great, good stuff. I look forward to learning more from you. Me too.